Chapter 15 Aranya bared her teeth, flicking her wrists to lengthen her talons. She stepped through the pooling blood, approaching the illusionist. You won't kill me, she said. He tipped his head and said nothing, neither acquiescence nor denial. Whose blood is this, she asked, approaching him. Without fully realizing it, her movements turned more animalistic, more predatorial, despite her being the hunted one. She slinked closer, muscles tensed. She didn't care if her words were snarls, if her teeth flashed in the darkness. It's your memory. Whose blood is it? I was sent to kill you. I don't care, Aranya snapped. You're not killing me, and that's that. Now make this illusion go away. Silence. She charged. He deflected the first swipe of her talons, ducking under her second. She growled like a wildcat, leaping again. This time, her talons sliced along his sleeve, but he moved so fast she only cut through fabric. He snatched one wrist, yanking it behind her. Her cry was that of a girl in pain, but she followed it with another wolfish snarl. She twisted in his grasp, trying to pivot and duck, but he slammed her against the wall of the cave. You're right, he said, his voice low as he pinned her. I'm not going to kill you, but then I must trap you so my comrades think you're dead. Nope, she gasped, face plastered against icy stone. You can also let me go. You can let me kill you. I cannot. Then the world shifted around them, and the illusionist, with a final wrench on her arm, shoved her to her knees. He turned and ran. She whirled, leaping to her feet, just in time to see him vanish through the cave opening. Chasing after him, she barreled over rocks as blood spattered on her garments. She focused on the scraps of moonlight she could see through that opening. The cave twisted. The opening disappeared, swallowed up by stone. She choked on her own air, frantically spinning on her heel to find it again. There it was, on the opposite side of the cave. Aranya growled, breaking into a run toward it. But the moment she got within a few feet, it shifted again, and she ran straight into a stone wall. She pummeled the wall with the side of her fist. You dragon blasted illusionist! It wasn't real. So why were the cavern walls solid beneath her touch? Why was the splattering blood wet on her legs as she ran? She turned for the opening and didn't immediately see it. But as she kept moving through the cave, she caught the barest trace of moonlight. She plunged deeper into the cave after it, all the hope in her soul tied up in finding her way out of this place. She dodged around stalagmites, ducked under stalactites, chasing that fragment of light. It led to an opening in the wall. She jumped down to the floor beneath. More blood, deeper this time. Aranya sucked in a shuddering breath, but did not let her pace flag. If anything, she was faster, chasing down the light, even though it would be gone the moment she had it within her grasp. She ran through the cave until she found the opening. She sprinted as fast as she could, trying to fling herself through it before it disappeared. Her shoulder was met with solid stone. The opening reappeared to her left. What else could she do? She dragged herself upright, but she couldn't bring herself to chase it again. It didn't matter. She would always be too late. It's not real, it's not real, she whispered into the darkness. She pressed her hand against the icy stone, as though to pass straight through the barrier. It was solid. She slid to the ground, not caring that she sat in blood. Curling up into a ball, she let her talons vanish. Sobs racked her chest, and she pressed her face into her hands. Aranya wept in despair. She would never see Ye Ye again, never see Kai or Delon or anyone else. Fathers, if she could but have one more chance, she would never be cross again. She would never be angry with Kai, and her landlord could take all her money. 
as long as she could be with Ye Ye, with Kai, with Delon. She didn't care if they lived out in the wilderness and ate nothing but rice cakes. Anything to be free of this night. Maybe this wasn't real. Maybe she was dreaming, and soon she would wake up with crusty eyelids to find Delon shaking her awake and telling her it was time to ride. More tears came, but these weren't the racking sobs of earlier. They were soft, mournful weeping. Not real, not real. None of this was real. She couldn't believe it. Kai, she tried so hard to hate him, but she couldn't keep lying to herself anymore. She longed for him to be here with her like he had been during her nightmare. She wanted his arms around her, his voice in her ear telling her that everything would be all right. Her entire life had been spent with only Ye Ye. But now, Ye Ye wasn't enough. She wanted Kai. He wasn't here. Eventually, Oblivion claimed her. When Aranya awoke, the world was bright. Brighter, at least. Legions brighter than the cave, though it was still night. She scrambled up and realized she stood on grass, on a grassy ledge, overlooking a stream that cut through woods. No ensnaring cave, no blood, none except her own staining her clothes. Her limbs trembled so much with relief that she collapsed back onto the ground on all fours. She stared at the grass, illuminated by the early dawn, and she thought she had never seen anything so beautiful in her life. Finally, rallying the last reserves of her strength, she stood again. She tried to take stock of where she was, to find out what direction to head. It wouldn't do to simply wander off in a random direction. She needed to stay close to the stream so she wouldn't get lost. Delon and Kai would need water. If they were still alive. Her best bet was to wander up and down stream with the hopes that she'd find someone. Drawing in a deep, fortifying breath, she began trekking upstream. She shook with hunger and the remnants of last night's despair. But the sun was shining, and no matter how weak she felt, she would not give up. She would see this through. She wouldn't wonder about what she would do if Delon and Kai hadn't made it. It only made panic bubble up like more choking sobs in her throat. Stick to the stream, one foot in front of the other. Swiping filthy hair out of her face, she took one determined step, then another. It seemed like hours, though from the slant of the sun, it couldn't have been long. Then, to her shock, she found crushed grass, as though it had been trampled underfoot. When she looked for more, a trail that someone had walked, she didn't find anything. To anyone else, this would have been discouraging. For Aranya, who looked for an Evanesser, this sent her blood pounding so hard she could barely think. There, there was a smear of blood on the grass. Not good, but perhaps Kai wasn't dead. He would have to be alive to Evanesse. She hurried further down the stream, discovering another spot. Oh, fathers, please. She needed to find him. She needed him. And then she looked up. There was a person. Aranya's heart quickened, the desperation in her soul focusing on that one point. A man, propped against a tree, not that far away. His head lolled, and she had a horrible thought that he was dead. But when she burst into a run and cried in broken sobs, Kai, his head snapped up. It was him. It was she Kai, leaning against that tree, and suddenly stumbling to get to his feet. He seemed to buckle beneath his own weight, collapsing back against the tree, but he called out, his voice laced with the same frantic relief as hers. Aranya. Her limbs wouldn't carry her fast enough, and a few times she stumbled, but after what seemed a thousand years, she fell to her knees beside him, fell straight into his open arms. Kai, she gasped, 
not even caring how desperately she wept. She only wanted to be as close to him as she possibly could. He pulled her against his chest, so tightly she could barely breathe. His own breaths were ragged, one of his hands fisting in her tangled hair. Oh, bless the fathers you're alive, he gasped. I couldn't find you, I looked everywhere. She whimpered, her arms tightening around his neck. Aranya, he said again, gripping her closer. She lifted her face from where it was buried against his collarbone, and his hazel eyes met hers, peering out of a dirt-smudged face. His hair was possibly even worse than hers, his garments torn and singed. Impulse overcame her. Choking on another sob, she pressed a kiss to his mouth. She tasted salt, copper, and dirt, but that didn't stop her from kissing him over and over again, all across his face. Kai caught her by the back of the head and dragged her into a long, deep kiss. Kai had thought he'd lost her. He'd lost her when the phoenixes set upon them, chasing them to different corners of this wretched wilderness. He tried to track her down, but no matter how hard he searched, he couldn't find her. Neither was there any sign of the phoenix who'd pursued her. There was plenty of blackened earth. Phoenix fire was known for leaving nothing behind. But now she was here in his arms, kissing him. Her haunted eyes were shut as she peppered his face with desperate kisses. Seeing her fire gone, seeing her fearlessness reduced to these tear-streaked cheeks and trembling limbs, it made him angry. And somehow, the incessant kisses only made him angrier. He caught her and drew her into a furious, desperate kiss of his own. She melted against him, kissing him back fervently, and he tightened his hold on her. He wasn't ever letting her go again. Then she whimpered and wrestled backward, unwrapping her arms to plant her hands against his chest. He released her, and her eyes were the size of moons in the dawn as she stared at him. Her panic was clear across her face. What am I doing? She cried, pressing a hand against her mouth, red blooming across her cheeks. I didn't mean, oh. He caught her face in both his hands, and her eyes widened even more as they flicked from his to his mouth. That look. She wouldn't resist him if he kissed her again. But he had no intention of doing that. Instead, he studied her face. Aranya, he said gently, willing the frantic light to go out of her eyes. He quelled his own alarm, focusing instead on what her face betrayed. There it was. The fear that had hounded his fearless companion through the night. Aranya, he said again, brushing the hair out of her face with his thumb. You're not alone anymore. You're with me now. The sob that shook her small frame nearly split his heart in two. She flung her arms around his neck again, pressing as close as she could, burying her face against him. He let her cry holding her like he'd always wanted to. She's alive. She's safe. He stroked her hair, but didn't touch her back. Blood stained her shredded tunic, the bits of exposed skin covered in crimson and purple. He almost didn't want to ask what happened, but they would have to worry about their wounds later. For now, he just held her. He felt the moment she drifted off to sleep, the moment the last bit of tension eased out of her and her ragged breathing turned steady. Though his own body ached, he was certain he never experienced anything so wonderful as knowing that Swan Aranya trusted him enough, felt safe enough with him to fall asleep in his arms. Chapter 16 Aranya woke to blinding sun. She winced, burying her face away from the light. She was aware first of how hungry, weak, and hurting her body was. Then she was aware of her face against someone's 
Kai's neck, his head resting atop hers, and his arms holding her in the crook of his side. Her hand gripped the front of his tunic, tightening as sunlight flared in her vision. Kai let out a soft moan, shifting when she did. He must have fallen asleep too. He lifted his head from hers, blinking against the light. No longer beside herself with panic, she registered how close they were and how much she didn't want to leave his embrace. That thought alone was enough to make her push away from him to try to get her feet under her again. His grip tightened, drawing her back against him, his eyes still closed. Stay, he murmured. A blush flared hot across her cheeks as she looked up at him. Don't you think we ought to get up? She asked, hands flattened against his chest, ready to push if necessary. We need to find Delon. He opened one eye, peering at her. He shifted toward her, leaning his head against the tree, and as if to reiterate his order to stay, wrapped both arms around her. We almost died, he mumbled. I want Snuggles. Snuggles, she squawked, suddenly bristling as she blushed deeper. We need to find Delon. We have a mission to accomplish. Delon will find us, he replied, wrestling with her half-hearted attempts to pull away. It's best if we stayed in one place and wait until he sniffs his way here. Oh, stop your flapping about. Just five more minutes? He offered up a sheepish grin. It's been hours, she cried, standing and freeing herself from his hold. We need to find food, and you, you've been injured. You couldn't stand up when I first found you. They both glanced down at his leg, at the blood staining his trousers. His sash was tied haphazardly around the wound. Kai leaned his head back against the tree and shrugged. I only was bitten by a dragon. Bitten by a dragon, she cried, falling to her knees next to his injury. She began pulling at the fabric, untying the bloody sash and rolling up the leg of his trousers. He raised one eyebrow, his mouth slipping into a lopsided smirk. Kiss me, and it'll make it all better. She shot him a glare, which he returned with a grin. You don't seem to be in much pain. Perhaps I shouldn't, oh, the pain, he cried, draping his arm across his forehead dramatically. I can hardly bear it. You're not helping your case. He dropped his arm and rolled his eyes. Fine. Would you believe me if I looked at you seriously and told you it hurts so bad I'd rather be in DU right now? She stared at the quirk in his lips, the sparkle in his eyes, and remained unimpressed. I'm going to assume the pain level is somewhere between agony and non-existent. He gave a disapproving snort in return, but said nothing as she rolled up his trousers until she found the wound on his mid-calf. He jerked when she reached it, proof that it did hurt. She grimaced at the blood, the torn flesh. Did it injure the bone? She asked, feeling carefully for sign of breakage. His jaw clenched, but he shook his head. Don't think so. We don't have bandages. I can clean it off, but there's little else I can do. He gave a grunt and a shrug. She eyed him, but he maintained his composure. Pulling a handkerchief from her robes, she swallowed her own grunt of pain as she got to her feet and neared the edge of the stream to wet it. She drank first, having not realized how parched she was. Then she squeezed the excess liquid out of the handkerchief and made her way back to Kai. The first pass of the cloth over his skin dragged a hiss from him, but he gritted his teeth and offered up a wan smirk. You bled a lot, she said. How did it even bite you? I accidentally evanesced on top of it when I tried to get away from the phoenixes. She couldn't help her snort. It took her two trips to the stream to rinse the handkerchief before his leg was clean, or as clean as it was going to get for now. 
As soon as she was done, Kai waggled his eyebrows and said, Wanna help distract me from the pain? We're professionals, Kai. She gave him a dour look. Indeed, and we've already kissed. He stopped to count on his fingers. Quite a few times. A few more can't hurt anything. None of those were supposed to happen, she protested, shoving back up to her feet, face hot. It's best if we pretend they never- He caught her ankle. Hey, she squawked. Let me go. Don't make me pull out my talons. Sit down. Your back has been shredded to ribbons. If you took care of my injury, I can take care of yours. I'm not- Sit. With a huff, Aranya plopped down on the ground, arms crossed. Kai shifted his weight behind her, coming closer to inspect the damage. Carefully, he gathered her hair and swept it over her shoulder to keep it out of the way, sending tingles shooting down her spine. There, he said. Now it'll stay out of the way. She swallowed. When he touched her back, however, she hissed. The frown was audible in his voice. This is going to be tricky. It would be best if the tunic was removed so I can clean the wounds thoroughly, but it appears that it is stuck to some of them. The shirt is pretty torn up, but I imagine you would object to me cutting it off. Indeed I would, she said. As long as it's the only tunic I have, I'd prefer it remain somewhat intact. Hmm. He cast a glance toward the stream. I think I have an idea. Come to the water. What happened anyway? I was dragged by my horse, she said sourly. I was knocked off by a branch, and my foot was stuck in the stirrup. Dragons, he cursed. I suppose that's also to blame for the purple lump on your forehead. She touched it, wincing as she did. Kai Evanes to the waterfront. What's your idea? She asked skeptically once she'd caught up to him. You're not going to like it, but I figured you'd like it better than taking a cold bath in your clothes. What is your idea? He scooted to the edge of the water, rolled his trousers up to his knees, and stuck his legs into the stream. Immediately, he jumped from the cold of it, but then flashed her a grin. You sit next to me, facing away from the stream, and we'll lower your back into the stream. Then, after a few minutes, it'll be easier to detach the garment from the wounds. She scowled. This sounds like a terrible idea. He only grinned. He wasn't. He was, wasn't he? You were going to dunk me, she cried. He gave a coughing, choked laugh. N no, absolutely not. I'm not doing it. I promise I won't dunk you, Kai said. Then he added, on purpose. Kai, come on. He grabbed her wrist and pulled her down beside him. I will do my best to keep you from falling, all right? Do you believe me? No, she muttered, even though it wasn't the truth. He took that as consent for him to grab her upper arms and start lowering her backward into the water. Wait, I'm not- It's all right, I've got you. She glared at him, and despite his reassurances, her core braced her legs scrambling for purchase on the grassy bank. This seems like a very, very bad idea. My hair is getting wet. He shot her an exasperated look. Your hair gets wet, or all of you gets wet. Here we go. She gripped his arms as he lowered her so far she was sure she'd fall, and then the cold flared across her skin. She yelped and jerked, but he only lowered her further. There, he said, his grip on her almost painfully tight. He strained, but maintained a solid hold. Now we wait. For how long, she chattered, trying to suppress her urge to flinch away from the cold. I already told you, a few minutes, just until it's easier to access the wounds and assess the damage. She huffed through a shiver. He smirked at her. She glanced away. Kai's face seemed the only place for her to look except the blazing sun, 
but she didn't exactly want to stare at him. Best to come up with a diversion. I think you should tell me about your family, she said. He flinched so hard, water splashed in her face. Don't go all brusque and mysterious on me. I'm your friend and comrade. You can trust me. He gave a dark, low chuckle, glancing off to one side. You know I won't tell anyone, but he said, friend, Aranya. His echoing chuckle was mirthless. Sometimes I'm not sure if you're just playing with me. She stuttered, taken aback. But that clench in his jaw and the look in his eye. He was trying to distract her from asking about his family. Aranya had no intention of being distracted, no matter how his words made her heart trip over itself. I have a few theories about your family, she said instead of responding to him. I've been thinking a lot about what you said that day, about how they had Gabe under their thumb. Sometimes I think you're playing hard to get, other times that you're oblivious or perhaps in denial. It was a game now. He would try to fluster her with confusing words, and she would try to trip him into admitting something. Having Gabe under their thumb is illegal, which means that your family is probably involved in something illegal. And that's aside from the whole traitor thing and clearly being in collusion with Fong, which you didn't know about. That means your family is involved in something else illegal that you knew about before we ever stepped foot in Gabe. His eyes snapped to hers with such sharpness, it only confirmed her theory. I'm right then, she announced, shifting her hips on the bank to a more secure position. My best guess for why you ran from them is that you don't want to be involved. Hence your mother and brother talking about you shirking your duties. That's my guess for a noble motivation, that is. Aranya, he warned, giving her a hard look. A look telling her not to press further, not to push him, not to prod. Icy water swept against her back, and her skin slowly went numb. In such an uncomfortable situation, she thought she was allowed a little prodding. She chose her weapon carefully. Well, if you ever wanted to be more than friends, she watched his eyes widen slightly. Good, she'd caught him off guard. Then you can't leave me in the dark on this forever. Plus, if you do, I'll just figure it out on my own. He tightened his grip on her arms and hefted her up onto the bank. She gasped, both from the ice dripping down her legs and the way the blood rushed to her head. Don't go poking around my family, he said, and he seemed more scared than angry. Just let it drop. Let me see your back now. Chapter 17 Aranya wrapped her arms around herself against the chill, her wet hair sticking to her skin. Tell me, Kai. He tipped his head, glaring at her. Then, while she was staring at him, he vanished. If you appear behind me one more time, I'll- I'm trying to tend your wounds, all right? Stop being so irksome, he said from behind her. Much less gently than last time, he moved her sopping hair aside and pulled carefully at the fabric. Most of it was fine, but a couple times the tunic was still stuck, and when he peeled it away, she jolted and hissed. Sorry, he mumbled, continuing his work. Once he'd finished, he reappeared in front of her and scooted so he faced away from her. Now you can take it off. I, it's only wound treatment. You don't need to blush so. He wasn't even looking at her. I'm not blushing, she growled, trying not to be self-conscious and completely vulnerable as she began working to remove the garment. Her movements were jerky, and it took everything to not let out a cry or a hiss at the sharp pain. But that would give Kai cause to turn around, and she couldn't have that. Once she had covered herself with the tattered, torn, and wet tunic, and drawn her knees up to her chest, she swallowed and mumbled, it's done. He vanished again without even turning around, and his warmth reappeared at her back. 
Of the things to be most worried and awkward about, she hoped her shoulders didn't appear bulkier when bare. He'd already made fun of them, and she wasn't sure she could bear it while so prone. He made no comment, only began dabbing at painful spots with the handkerchief. She braced herself against each pass of the cloth, squeezing her eyes shut and trying not to allow stray tears to leak out. She swallowed each hitch in her breathing. There was only one thing she could think of to distract her from the pain and from his heat at her back. I think your family is connected to the brigands. His hand froze. When he spoke, his voice was that dark, low tone he'd used with her when she'd first threatened to betray him to them. Don't provoke me. You're quite disadvantaged presently. I'm not provoking you. I'm only trying to understand. I'm trying to understand you. Why you'd be willing to compromise our mission to keep your secret. Besides, no matter what you say, I know you won't hurt me. That's not it at all, Aranya. Her name was a growl on his lips. He appeared in front of her, catching her face with both of his hands. She flinched, clutching her tunic tighter to her chest and scooting backward. Kai, you know why I don't want to tell you? He growled. She stared up at him, breath caught in her lungs, her heart racing. She gave her head a small shake. Because my brother knows your name, knows you, and it will take him very little time to gather your personal information. He knows you're associated with me, and he has reason to believe I care about you, which means I'm more likely to entrust this sort of information to you. Which means you will be very useful to him. Everything in the world narrowed to his face, his hands on her jaws, his furious, beautiful eyes. Oh, fathers, she was a lost cause. She, Kai, would be the downfall of her in more ways than one. Kai didn't stop. And do you know what he will do with you? He will use you against me, and he will know exactly how to make you bend to his will. How, she asked stupidly, her mind spinning, but not quite able to fully understand. I didn't bend before. He'll use your grandfather. He could have punched her in the gut. Her jaw fell open, the air gone from her lungs. She stared at him, grappling with what this implied and with what he wasn't telling her. The theories about his family that had been stewing in her mind now swarmed to the forefront of her thoughts. Kai must have believed her placated because he evanesced behind her again. She straightened her back instinctively, trying not to flinch too much when his long fingers gripped her shoulder, and he continued wiping away the blood and painfully working out bits of debris that had gotten lodged under her skin. What happened back there with your mother and brother? She asked softly. When you went into that room with them. His fingers pressed into her collarbone as he gripped her shoulder harder. Then he sighed and allowed hesitantly, they were threatening me, that's all. Nothing new? Nothing new. When the sopping, red-stained kerchief finally made its last pass, her shoulders sagged in relief. Behind her, there was shuffling, and when she carefully turned, she was just in time to see Kai shrug out of his own tunic, only his thin undershirt retaining his propriety. Her cheeks went hot. She quickly averted her gaze. He held out the garment to her. I know, I know, it stinks, but I thought it might be better than your wet tunic. We can hang yours up to dry. Why wouldn't her tongue form words? Her mind fogged up, but she nodded mutely and accepted the tunic. Like before, he evanesced in front of her, back facing her, so she could see him and the scant privacy he offered her. She worked quickly, her wounds and skin prickling in the cool breeze of the wind. The garment was much too big, hanging down past her knees, but she wasn't about to complain. It smelled like him, albeit a slightly stinky version of him. She didn't really care. She got to her feet without saying anything to him, carrying her wet garments to the tree and hanging them up, 
angling the undergarments away so he wouldn't see them. Then, crossing her arms across her chest, she eased herself down to a sitting position by the tree they'd napped under earlier. Kai's head was cocked. You can turn around now, she said, drawing the neckline of his tunic closer self-consciously. He evanesced right to her side, flung an arm around her shoulders, surprisingly carefully, and tucked her in close. Now we can snuggle. Hey, you look good in my shirt. Aranya squawked wordlessly, flailing her arms in surprise. She stumbled to her feet, out of his reach, and sat down again, away from him. No, now we have to figure out a plan for food and for finding Delon. Kai glared at her. Besides, we need to discuss Fong Tsurong. Why? Because that was him, back at the waterhole. I'm sure of it. I thought so too, said Kai. I think the old man he had with him was Du Liosien, the Evanesser. That would explain why he was here, so far from Butagen. Liosien is an Evanesser who could cross leagues at once, so it appears Fong is using him as sort of a traveling aid. He propped his elbow on his good leg. Du Liosien could evanesce with other people, so that must be how Fong is using him. You remember that from the packet they gave us at Suguan? I thought you didn't read it. Aranya couldn't help the way the words came out a touch wryly. The look he gave her was withering. I can be studious when I want to, love. That one word sent her heart tripping over herself. She set to ripping up blades of grass and splitting them into smaller and smaller strips. Anything to avoid Kai's gaze. But actually, I knew that because he's a powerful Evanesser. Back before his disappearance, my parents had hoped he would have a daughter that Yong or I could marry. It made sense. Aranya still felt like an idiot when the only thing she could think of to say was, oh. He never married, however. At some point, many years ago, his name just stopped coming up in conversation. My parents focused their matchmaking efforts elsewhere. Aranya forced her hands to stop touching the grass. So he's a powerful Evanesser that Fong captured and continues to use to further Fong's own purpose. It stands to reason that the rest of the missing wielders are likewise imprisoned against their will and being used. Kai nodded grimly. For a moment, their eyes met, and then he said softly, I'm glad you're safe, and that we found each other again. Her throat tightened until she could only manage a nod in return. They passed the afternoon making camp and avoiding starvation while they waited for Delan. Kai watched Aranya closely as she tried to piece together her fragmented sense of control. His flirting wasn't helping with that, but it was distracting her, and he couldn't let her spiral back down to where she'd been this morning. So, he kept throwing out comments that turned her cheeks red, and probably too many requests for kisses. Anything to keep her snappy, rather than scared. Since Aranya was the more mobile of the two, he'd handed over his Jian and Sling, and she'd gone hunting. When she came back with two rabbits, that creeping fear lurked in her eyes again, returning as sure as night fell. What if Delon doesn't find us? She said, by way of greeting. What if something happened to him? What if a Morguai finds- Then we wouldn't have to worry about someone badgering us to keep things professional between us. He waved his hand. Oh wait, you do that anyway. Never mind. I suppose that would be a conundrum if he doesn't find us, wouldn't it? Kai took the rabbits from her and began skinning and skewering them to roast over the fire he'd built while she was gone. Her face twisted into both horror and outrage, and he could only be relieved that it wasn't terror anymore. She glanced between the extra knife in his belt and the second rabbit next to him. She blinked quickly, glancing away from the carcasses, the blood on Kai's hands as he worked. I'll do this, he said. Can you fill the skin with more water? I drank it all while you were gone. She rolled her eyes, snatched up the skin, and headed toward the stream. 
His too large tunic hung from her shoulders as she rubbed her arms. She glanced every which way, almost as flighty as the creatures she'd just hunted. His hands slowed at his work. Then he bent back down over the rabbits, renewing his efforts. They both were half starved, and if he wasn't careful, he'd cut himself with his jittery hands. Will you be able to walk again soon? Aranya asked when she came back, sitting on the opposite side of the fire and rubbing her palms near the blaze. Through the mess of her hair, her dark eyes lifted to his. There was that fear again. He suspected it wouldn't totally be gone until they got out of this dragon-blasted situation and were back on the hunt again. Or would it continue to haunt her even then? He glanced down at his leg, rebandaged with his sash. The pain was still substantial, but he wasn't about to admit that to her. He waved a hand. I can walk, but I will walk much better tomorrow, I think. She smiled a little at that, dropping her gaze to the fire as he began roasting the meat. They sat in silence, the sizzle and smell of rabbit filling the air. Her smile slipped into a pensive, faraway expression. Come eat, Kai said. She blinked, eyes coming into focus again. Food, finally. With jerky, pained movements, she got to her feet and came to his side of the fire. He handed her a stick laden with meat. She took it with a mumbled thanks, not looking at him. And as she turned to retreat to her side of the fire, he reached out to her impulsively. Just as quickly, he retracted his hand. It was covered in blood. Blood and fur. Disgusting. There's more coming he said lamely, nodding toward the other meat cooking over the fire. It was the only way he could express what he wanted to say. Please stay. Please, please stay. She bit her lip, and as if reaching the end of a long inner debate, sat down next to him. He closed his eyes in relief, then focused back on roasting the rest of the meat while she ate. Once it was all skewered and over the fire, he evanesced to the stream to clean his hands and fingernails. He evanesced back to her side, crossed his good leg, leaving the other stretched out and chanced to look at her face. Tell me about your grandfather, he said, removing another skewer from the fire and blowing on it. He purposefully occupied himself with these mundane movements refusing to meet the sudden flashing of her attention toward him. All I know is that he's a shapeshifter, prefers to be a white cat, and likes to rack up fines at your tenement. She gave a mirthless chuckle, her hand pausing on its way to her mouth with a bite. When she spoke, her gaze wouldn't leave the fire's dancing flames. He's cared for me as long as I can remember. Always good-natured, quick to laugh, slow to scold. I still manage to earn a lot of those, she said with a sheepish smile. It faded into a thin line, her bruised forehead furrowing. Somewhere along the way, however, it slowly switched from him caring for me to me caring for him. It happened so gradually, I almost didn't notice. But it became harder and harder with the academy. Then years later, I was always getting special permission to leave so I could go check on him. I'll never forget. She stopped, swallowed hard. The skewer of meat remained untouched in her hand. Kai waited, her eyes closed. I'll never forget when I came back, after being gone for two days. And he, her voice caught, her throat bobbing furiously. When she finally spoke again, her voice was barely above a whisper, as if she feared it would break entirely if she spoke too loudly. He hadn't eaten because he couldn't cook anymore. He hadn't eaten in two days. I found him collapsed on the ground. I thought he was dead and it was my fault. Kai's lips parted. She sniffed, wiping the back of her, his sleeve across her eye. Then she drew in a deep breath, wrenched meat off the skewer 
and set to eating vigorously. He ate much slower, his stomach nodding with each swallow. He had to ask, had to know why she had been alone. Where were your parents? She had just taken a particularly large bite, and Kai waited while she chewed. But then she just shrugged, her mouth trying to twist into a smile, another attempt to keep from crying. They're gone, she growled, stuffing more rabbit into her face. Died when I was little. Both? They got sick. Apparently we lived out of the city then, and I guess it was one of those things that came and went so quickly, they just... How old were you? She snorted. Yeah, yeah, said I was two. He believed I was too young to have any memories of them. But I do remember. One or two things. They're fuzzy, but I remember trying to climb out of my bed and getting frustrated. Ma was there. She put me back to sleep. But by now, I sometimes wonder if I only remember my memory of them. Like, the memory itself has become too faded over the years. Where's the rest of your family? That was it. Just me and Ye Ye. But your parents had no siblings? No family of their own? She shrugged, biting her lip. I guess not. Ye Ye, he didn't want to talk about my parents. When I was younger, I used to ask a lot about them. He was never cross with me, but whenever I asked, he would get... His hands would tremble a little. He always redirected the conversation. Was he your mother's or father's father? Mother's. It wasn't until I was older and I began to piece together what happened. What troubled Ye Ye about them? About him? She wouldn't look at him. Hadn't looked at him in some while now. Unconsciously, after finishing her meal, she reached up with one hand and gripped her shoulder, rubbing the skin almost nervously. Oh, her magic. The pieces of the puzzle finally fit together. Your mother, he said slowly, was a full shifter. But she didn't marry another shifter. Your father didn't have magic at all, did he? Aranya looked up, her eyes bright and liquid as night fell around them. Your grandfather didn't approve of the match. She shrugged. I can't know for certain, but I suspect as much. This was why she was only a partial shifter. Her father's blood diluted the magic in her lineage. Sometimes, sometimes I wondered if he feels guilty for their deaths, perhaps. Maybe not because he caused it or anything like that. Or that he'd been unkind to my father, but... Perhaps he felt responsible, in a way? It's only my speculation. I only have what I know of him, and a few snippets I've gathered over the years. The fire popped and crackled, its light seeming smaller as the darkness grew deeper. She startled slightly at a particularly large pop, her gaze darting to his to see if he'd caught the movement. He had, but he didn't let her see that. Was it hard, taking care of your grandfather by yourself? No, no. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Good things can be hard. She looked down, chewing on her lip. Tears welled on her lower lashes. Wordlessly, she shut her eyes and nodded. After a long minute, yes, it was hard. It was hard and lonely. His hand itched to reach out and take hers. He longed to offer that bit of comfort, to show her that she wasn't alone anymore. But he didn't move. And you can't tell me anything about your family? She asked abruptly. He wanted to tell her. Desperately longed to tell her everything. Partially because he'd never truly talked about it with anyone. He couldn't. But also because he wanted her to see him to understand. Perhaps there were things he could share without giving her information that wouldn't be good for her to possess. 
He leaned back against the tree, feeling suddenly as far away from her as when she was on the other side of the fire, even though she sat next to him. It was stupid, but he longed to hold her in his arms again while he told her about his family. He just wanted that comfort, that assurance. He took a great swig of water, the sudden weight of her attention heavy on him. She wasn't thinking about Ye Ye anymore or the fragmented memories of her parents. For the first time that day, since they'd cleaned the wounds on her back, he was the one fighting a flush. Why was this so hard? It wasn't like it was some dramatic story. Why did he feel this cavernous need for her affection as he fought to articulate it? It never felt like a family, he said at long last. He drank more water, lots more. Aranya waited, patient and quiet. It felt like, like another version of the Academy, but worse. Competition, no nonsense, so much pressure. He wasn't making any sense. Drawing a deep breath in, he took another swig of water. It was me or Young. It always should have been Young. He was older. He actually wanted it. I never wanted any part in it. Mother wanted it to be young, but father, he wanted it to be me. When he died, he left it to me. I didn't want it. The last words came out in a growl. And now I can't get them to leave me alone. When he dared to look her way, firelight danced across her face, sharp and erratic, as the gears seemed to turn in her mind. She was putting the pieces together. He shut his mouth. How had he ever thought her dull? She was quicker than a whip. Her brain operated in puzzles and riddles, always trying to figure things out. His family was another riddle for her to solve, like the mystery of Feng Tse-dong and the vanishing wielders. He shouldn't have spoken at all. Aranya's lips parted, her head tilting. Your father... Oh, stupid phoenix scorched dragons. She knew. And if she knew, how could he protect her? He shut his eyes as she said the words, her voice low and breathless. He was a crime lord, wasn't he? A lord of brigands. His silence was answer enough. He wanted you to take his place, she whispered. He made you his heir. And that is why you hid, and why your mother and brother are trying so hard to find you. Aranya, Aranya, Aranya. His heart throbbed a painful rhythm as memories kept returning of his father, his cold mother, his calculating brother. All the fights, the family dinners turned into strategy and training meetings. His father hadn't been just any crime lord either. He was lord of the hidden ones, the most fearsome network of brigands, the network of people born without the bureaucracy's knowledge, the people who never existed, who couldn't be traced or tracked in the government's records. When we arrested those kidnappers back in Sushui, that siren Le Hua and the earth wielder, Aranya leaned closer to him, they were broken out of the incarceration unit that night. You did that, didn't you? He gave a short, bitter chuckle. It was my responsibility while at the academy to deal with any hidden ones who were caught by the Suguan wardens. I had to break them out. That was why I did so many pranks. I'd have to evanesce in and out of the incarceration unit at night, and then I couldn't fall asleep for hours. Besides, Le Hua knew who I was. If I didn't silence her, she would have revealed my location to my brother. So we made a bargain. There were so many things he knew, so many things he wished he'd never known. He hated these bonds, these ties, and possibly what he hated the most was that he couldn't bring Aranya into that dynamic. Aranya. Kai, he blinked realizing belatedly that she had come closer to him, was leaning over him. 
His breath hitched as he registered how close she was, how wide and concerned her eyes were. Kai, she said again, are you all right? Clenching his jaw, he turned his face away from hers. He had so little self-control as it was, and the last thing he needed to see was her parted lips hovering so near. Her hand landed gently to cover his, making his heart lurch. And before he knew what he was doing, he entwined his fingers with hers, like they'd done at his family's house. And this little bit of contact became his lifeline. Her hands were small, but square, strong, and calloused. He squeezed it tightly, probably too tightly. Even by the sparse light of the fire that illuminated only half of her face, he could see her cheeks flushed crimson, see her searching his face as her thumb brushed across the back of his hand. Kai, it's all right. He ignored the pain in his leg and pushed up. He reached out, impulse overcoming reason, and brushed his fingers against her cheek. She froze, eyes widening, as he slid his hand further, along her jaw. Is this all right? He asked, his voice breaking, his heart aching and pounding in his chest. Please, let me kiss you, Aranya. Please want me to kiss you. He didn't want her to comfort him because she pitied him. He wanted her to want him. She swallowed, her chest and shoulders raising and lowering with every breath. He tangled his fingers into her hair, pulling her face nearer to his. Aranya, tell me if you want this. If you want me. Her lips parted, her pulse racing beneath his touch but he searched her dark irises for a sign of what ran through her mind, for an answer. He saw it, a fraction of a second before she closed her eyes, twisting her face away from his. His heart plummeted down through the earth, straight to Diyu. Watching her lips draw into that thin line gutted him so thoroughly, he could only stare with his jaw unhinged and gaping. He'd thought, Bitterness swelled in his soul. Why did she torment him like this? How long till Delon finds us? She asked, her voice wavering traitorously. She withdrew her hand from his and twisted her face free of his hold. Kai growled, letting her go without a fight. He wasn't about to answer her question. He didn't know. And at the moment, he didn't care where in the Seven Valleys Delon was. She had wanted to give in, but something else had won out. The same thing that had driven her into his arms this morning yanked her away from him tonight. Her fear of being alone. Funny how his own deep fear so mirrored her own. Yet it made him reach out, even as it made her flinch away. As if hearing his thoughts, she whispered, you're not going back to Sushwe. Not a question. A statement. He didn't answer. What was the point? She gave a dry, empty laugh. I suppose I'll get the appointment after all. She didn't ask where he would go after this was over. She knew he didn't know. And if he did, he couldn't tell her. Not if she was to avoid becoming Young's next target. I'll take the second watch, Kai said instead. Moving carefully to not disturb his bad leg, he lowered himself to the ground. He stopped, finding his balled-up cloak next to him. With gritted teeth, he picked it up and tossed it a little too hard at Aranya. Stay warm. Then, he turned so his back was toward the fire and tried to fall asleep. Chapter 18 Aranya huddled under Kai's cloak the night growing colder and darker by the hour. Autumn was taking hold, readying to plunge Junning High into icy winter. Her heart wouldn't stop racing. First, from how her lips burned from the kiss that never happened, then with dread as she pieced together more understanding of Kai's family 
and the things she'd heard at his house. And finally, from the slightest movement or noise in the forest surrounding them. She stared at his turned back, hating herself, hating how his face had changed from pleading and desperate to hard and cold. That shift kept replaying in her mind, and though it had been her rejecting him, in many ways it was like he'd rejected her, too. But then he'd given her his cloak, even when he was so angry, and that had to count for something. Why was this so complicated? He wasn't returning with her to Tzu Shui. What was the point of this, a feeling, if it was going to be over the moment they finished their mission? What good was a kiss when the affection and devotion it promised were gone the minute it was over? She wasn't interested in being a passing fancy. There was something she was interested in, and she doubted it was the same thing he wanted. But even if he did want the same thing, as long as Ye Ye lived, they couldn't be together. She had to devote herself to his care, and she couldn't allow him to become a pawn in Shi Yang's games. Wind howled in the treetops, and Aranya wrapped Kai's cloak tighter around her shoulders. She glanced around, straining for any sight or sound of predators. Her hackles raised as leaves rustled the noise so loud it could disguise any Mwagwe approach. They would be fine. Kai was here, with her, and if anything attacked them, she could call for him, and they'd fight together. Unless, of course, something killed her silently, or one of those snake monsters bit her, and she was too late to call for help. Where were these paranoid thoughts coming from? She tried to calm her breathing, like they had taught at the academy. Controlling one's fears was an important part of one's job. She had to learn. It just hadn't felt so difficult until now. Would the lawn ever come? Was he hurt? Was he dead? The hours passed in slow torture until it was finally time for Kai's watch. But even then, could she let her guard down long enough to fall asleep? Wrapped up in his cloak, she trudged to Kai's sleeping form and hesitated. He was peaceful sleeping there, and he'd been so upset earlier. If she woke him, it would only bring back memory of, of. She drew in a fortifying breath. But just as she was about to nudge him with her toe, she stopped and shook her head in frustration. Instead, she bent down to her knees, placed a hand on his arm, and said with a gentle shake, Kai, wake up. He groaned. It's your watch. Another groan. Then he reached up like he was going to fling his arm over his eyes, but instead he rested his hand on top of hers. She flinched unintentionally. Kai, wake up, she said, shaking him a little more forcefully now. Shut up, partial. I'm awake, he growled. Oh, good. He dragged himself into a sitting position, groaning all the while, and leaned back against the tree. His eyes fixed on the dying fire, blinking slowly, and never once drifted her way. It didn't matter. She didn't care. All that was important was getting some rest. She shuffled back to her spot, shivering a little, and plopped down on the ground. The wind howled overhead, and her head snapped up instinctively. Don't worry, I won't let the monsters eat you while you sleep, Kai muttered. She glanced at him, at his sleep must hair and scowl, and impulse overtook her. Are you angry with me? Angry? He asked, his face contracting in confusion before it cleared. No. Are you sure? He finally looked up at her then, and if a face could be impatient, amused, and only half awake at once, that was his expression. Then he held up one arm, opening the space at his side. Just come here, he said, and his words were so slurred she almost didn't discern them. But his hazel eyes, glowing in the firelight, fixed on her so intently, his arm remaining poised in the air. Uh, she said stupidly, her blush seeping down her neck. 
When she didn't move, he sniffed, lowered his arm, and turned back to the fire. He seemed more alert now, which was a good thing if he was going to be of any use against said monsters. But she was tired, scared, and half out of her mind. That was the only explanation for why she scooted to Kai's side, staring up at him and silently pleading for him not to turn her away, even though she turned him away. Ever the contrary one, Kai muttered, side-eyeing her. If you think puppy eyes is all it's going to take, she wasn't going to wait for whatever nonsense he was about to say. She slid up to him, leaning her head against his shoulder. Her face went hotter than fire, but here she was safe. Not on the other side of the fire. Here. Kai let out a low chuckle, sighing and then opening his arms to her. She curled into his side, a relieved exhale escaping her lips. Oh, Aranya, he mumbled. What am I going to do with you? Nothing, just let me sleep here. You drive a hard bargain, little friend. She didn't answer, too tired and flustered to say anything. As if sensing her mood, he drew her closer and pulled his cloak tighter around her. My arms are always open for you, he whispered. No matter if I mad or not. Me and every other girl, she mumbled. No, just you. She didn't hear his voice. She felt it, rumbling through his chest and into her face. It was the only soothing thing in her current perception. She winced against morning light, against the crick in her neck, the ache in her back and hips. Kai still held her, his warmth surrounding her. Somehow, she hadn't expected him to stay instead of extricating himself once she was asleep. It was a relief he was here. Her muscles relaxed, and she burrowed deeper into his chest. Shh, she's still asleep, Kai said in a hushed tone to, not her. Glad you two got cozy while I was gone, came the wry reply. Aranya's eyes flew open, and her head shot up, hitting Kai's chin. I said to be quiet he growled. Now we've woken her up. Delon, she cried, scrambling to unsteady feet. Before Kai could catch her, or before Delon could even brace himself, she tumbled forward and flung her arms around him. I thought you were dead. Now the tears were coming again. Dragons eat them. She couldn't cry in front of Kai and Delon. Have a little faith in a man, dearie, Delon chuckled patting her back lightly. A few scrapes and bruises, but otherwise hardly worse for the wear. You don't look so, well, perhaps I shouldn't finish that sentence. If I've learned anything from my wife, leave it to you two to get yourselves into all manner of scrapes. Seven valleys, Kai, what did you do to your leg? Aranya pulled away from Delon, swiping furiously at her cheeks, as she glanced back in time for Kai to level an irritated glare at Delon. But then they were both looking at her, and a muscle jerked in Delon's jaw at the sight of the tears she was trying to swallow. The last thing she needed right now was their attention. She had to control herself and her emotions. The past two nights might have been hard, but that didn't give her liberty to break down now. She sniffed, wiped her eyes with her sleeve, and walked to the other side of the tree where she'd hung the rest of her clothes. What do we do now? She asked, forcing her voice to steady. We keep going, Delon replied, matter-of-factly. We see this mission through, and you both will thank me. I saved our horses. Aranya poked around from the other side of the tree. The horses? Over there, by the stream. That's why it took me so long to find you. I went to find your horse first. Stupid beast was about to be food for dragons, but I saved it in time. Her shoulders dropped with relief. She ducked back behind the tree and said, I'll change, then we can go. 
Changing with men nearby always made her nerves extra jumpy, but she worked quickly. On the other side of the tree, Delon began whispering in a hushed tone. Evidently, he thought he was being quieter than he was. What happened to her? I don't know. You didn't ask? She didn't seem to want to talk about it. Her back was pretty bad. Her cheeks heated, and she fought another swell of rising tears. Almost as if on cue, pain shot up her spine, and she bit back a cry as she fussed her tunic on. It wasn't as roomy as Kai's, restricting her movements. But if she made a sound, Kai would volunteer to help, and she didn't need that. When she finished and poked around the tree again, trying to pretend she hadn't just overheard their conversation, she held out the limp garment to Kai. He was still seated on the ground, and she was suddenly afraid he wasn't as mobile as he'd told her yesterday. Here, she said as professionally as she could. Thank you for letting me borrow it. Kai shrugged, not accepting it. Keep it. You looked better in it than I ever did. She paused, frowned. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Take your Phoenix Scorch shirt, boy, snapped Delon. Kai shot Delon a glare, snatched the garment out of Aranya's hand, and vanished. He reappeared in the saddle of his horse by the stream. Delon rolled his eyes, then followed. She hesitated for a brief second, glancing at the embers of the fire, then the spot where Kai had held her all night. She shook her head, steeling herself against the blush crawling up her neck. They had a mission to accomplish, to finish. They were so close. They had solved much of the mystery. Fong Tsudong had kidnapped the wielders to use their magic and was keeping them imprisoned in his fortress near the border of Jenninghai. He also had magic that could capture and compel Muagwe to do his bidding and the captured wielders to obey him. They had all but confirmed it. And when they discussed their theories with Delon, he agreed. Now it was time to rescue the missing wielders and the princess. Chapter 19 The next several weeks passed in a blur of traveling. There was so much ground to cover, and the day slipped away with the dull clatter of horse hooves, the changing of bandages for wounds, long nighttime watches, and a handful of trips to towns to buy supplies and send updates to Suguan. Aranya tried not to worry as they traveled. Were they too late? By the time they reached Fong Sedong's fortress, would there still be a chance to rescue the imprisoned wielders? Would their message arrive fast enough to the capital that troops would be on their way to the same location? Or would they arrive and find themselves alone in enemy territory? I think we'll arrive tomorrow. Delon said, stretching his legs out by the fire and taking a big bite out of a rice cake. Kai broke a stick and tossed it into the fire, arm dangling off his knee. Aranya watched that stick burn, turning black as the fire licked around the edges. What if we arrive and no one's there, she asked. Do we try to rescue them on our own? Delon snorted. Definitely not. We will arrive, assess the situation, and if there's already an encampment set up, which I think is very likely, considering the amount of border patrol near Butagan, then we will meet with whoever is in charge, exchange information, and after that, make plans for infiltrating the fortress. Aranya nodded, pinching the bridge of her nose absently. She happened to glance up and found Kai watching her. Her cheeks colored. They settled down for the night. Aranya took first watch, since Kai hadn't evanesced that day. She fidgeted with her knife, then the strings of her cloak. Her thoughts swirled around her mind, punctuated by flashes of terror whenever the dark world around her rustled. What's the matter? She jumped, swiveling her head to where Kai had appeared next to her. Pressing a hand to her heart as though the pressure would reduce its frantic rhythm, she gasped, you startled me. A good warrior never startles, he replied, 
smirking as he drew one knee up so he could rest his elbow on it. Say, how long do you think we have to talk before Delon smells our conversation? She couldn't help her smile. Get some sleep, Kai. Not until you tell me what was making you frown so severely and startle like a newborn deer. Make yourself comfortable then. Hey, he said, much gentler. Look at me, Partial. She delayed long enough to be petty, then rolled her eyes his way in a glare. You know I hate it when you call me that. Very well. Love? She scowled. But his face wasn't the mocking, satirical smile she anticipated. Instead, his hazel eyes glowed gold in the firelight, his eyebrows pinched, and his head tilted. You haven't been yourself since that night. It's been weeks. What? His question trailed off as his eyes searched hers. What happened, he was trying to say. She looked away, drawing her knees up to her chest and wrapping her arms around them. She gave a little shrug, smiling half-heartedly. You don't have to tell me, came Kai's gentle reply to her silence. I just want you to know that I'm here if you do want to talk about it. Sometimes letting it out helps it not fester. Her eyes followed his absent movements as he ran his fingers down the scabs formed along his leg. Then he picked up a stick, and to her surprise, instead of breaking it, he began drawing it through the dirt. Unbidden, her heartbeat accelerated. Could she bring herself to speak of that night? It was over. It would never happen again. If she left it alone, eventually she'd recover. Her fear would not control her forever. The words bubbled up in her throat, but they lodged there, sticky as unshed tears. Back and forth, the memories came to the surface, only to be shoved back down under the pressure and struggle of articulation. Instead, different words came out. Why you? Pardon? She rocked back and forth on her heels, keeping her voice low to not disturb Delon. Why did your father leave it to you? Kai's stick stilled. His shoulders crept up with the mounting tension, his jaw locking shut tightly. Then he tossed the stick into the fire. Letting it out will help it not fester, she teased. Don't throw my words back at me. I'll make a deal with you. We will confess or fester together. If you tell me about that night, I'll answer your question. What do you say? His head cocked toward hers. You said I didn't have to tell you if I didn't want to. And you don't. His lips twisted, but just at the same time, a loud snore erupted from the other side of the fire. Both of them tensed, Kai looking ready to vanish in an instant. But Delon only rolled over, his breathing turning quiet and even again. Aranya swallowed, squeezing her eyes shut, and whispered, after we were separated and I was knocked from my horse, the phoenix pursued me until I killed it. Killed it? With what? His eyebrows rose even as they furrowed. I threw my knife at it. Kai let out a low, rumbling chuckle as he shook his head. Seven valleys. Only you, Aranya. Only you. She wasn't sure what that was supposed to mean, but he seemed impressed. That wasn't the hardest part to recount, though. Her nails dug into the leather of her boots as she continued, trying to keep her story as sterile, as pragmatic as possible. Despite her best efforts, however, half-choked words spilled out of her lips. There were so many of them, all around me, slithering and, and the sounds, and they were coming for me, and I didn't know if you were still alive. She was trembling all over as she kept talking, fighting the emotion that kept latching its claws into her voice, fighting the helplessness that settled on her shoulders. It was over 
over, over. But it stayed. Why wouldn't it go? Why couldn't she forget it all? She had to finish this mission, had to return to Ye Ye. She couldn't let her own qualms get in the way. Kai's shoulder bumped hers. It's all right. She bowed her head, letting a few tears trail free. His solid hand rested on her back. You don't have to cry alone anymore, he whispered. Those gentle words were enough to make the floodgates spill open. She buried her face in her hands, sobbing as quietly as she could to not wake Delon. Kai wrapped his arm around her, drew her slowly to his chest, and it only made her cry harder. This taste of affection, of care. But he wasn't coming back to Tzu Shui. It would be just her and Ye Ye again, until eventually, it was just her. Finally, her tears spent, she sniffled, sitting up straighter and swiping the back of her sleeve against her wet cheeks. Your turn, she croaked, wrapping her arms tighter around her legs. He slid his hand back to his lap, staring down as he played with the fringes of his robes, the seams of his trousers. My brother was like my mother, but my father, he was different. Still corrupt as a set of market scales, but not the way they were. He bunched his face like he was struggling to express exactly what he meant. I think there was a part of him that didn't want to do the business. He at least went through the trouble of justifying it. Twisted, warped logic, but it was something. He knew I hated every part of it, and he thought that made me more suited to the task. I did everything I could at the academy, at home, to convince my family of my aversion to responsibility, from neglecting my studies, to purposefully failing exams, to having those dalliances. I wanted them to believe me an idiot. I had my father fooled with the rest of them, until he sent an order that instead of breaking out one of the brigands from the incarceration unit, I was to kill him. How could I kill someone who was asleep and weaponless in a cell? I couldn't, so I freed him. That was when my father knew. Aranya waited, her tears dried to her cheeks so that every facial movement felt crusty. He gave a soft huff, lifting his gaze from his twiddling fingers to the smoldering embers of the fire. Then his eyes darted to hers, but almost as quickly fled to find refuge again in the fire. I'm not doing it, he said at last. They can do whatever they want to manipulate me and coerce me into it. I won't bend. But I fear most for what they might attempt to do to you. I will need to come up with something to keep them away from you. Can they be stopped? Why can't you turn them into law enforcement? For being traitors and running an illegal band of brigands? It felt like a stupid question, because surely if it were as simple as turning them into the authorities, Kai would have already done it by now. Unless he was more loyal to his family than to Jenning Hai. If I turn them in, I'll be killed, Kai replied, his voice empty. Besides, the way it's structured, if I hand over my mother and brother, the rest will escape. A new leader will rise. Cutthroats will be sent to dispatch me and any connected to me. Her lips parted, the implications of his statement warring in her sluggish mind. So, as long as you're running from your family, I'm at risk. His throat bobbed, muscles jerking in his jaw and neck. He ran a hand down his face. I tried to keep you out of it. And Delon? I don't know. He's certainly in a better position than you, but I can't know for certain. A rueful, thin-lipped smile. You see why I wanted that appointment in Sushui? There has to be a way to free you from your family. He shrugged. If the government discovered the operation on its own, then perhaps something could be done. But brigand networks are like cockroaches. They survive. There is always someone to fill any vacated space, and they are vengeful. 
but I won't let them hurt you. The promise was spoken forcefully enough, yet she couldn't help but wonder how much power he truly had to keep that promise. A log breaking and falling into the fire split the silence, sending up a shooting display of glowing sparks. Kai said nothing more, his attention fully fixated on that log as it blackened and crumbled around the edges. You should sleep, Aranya whispered. I should do many things, he replied absently. Doesn't mean I do them. Heaven forbid you do what you ought. He grinned. I, indeed. Then he sighed and got to his feet. With a cocky salute and a smirk, he laid down on his back and stared up at the stars. Good night, she said with a smile. Good night, Partial. Just as I suspected, Delon announced the next evening. Signs of encampment, on this side of the river border, no less. It must be reinforcements. Indeed, as he spoke, smoke curled out of the forest tops below the rise they stood on. Aranya stared, her heart pounding impatiently in her chest, at that sign of comrades, of rest from travel, of imminent battle. But it was what stood beyond the thread of Blue River winding through the emerald forested countryside that arrested her full attention. A bulwark guarded that hill, threatening and fierce. It was enormous, built of gray stone, with not a sign of color softening the severe edges of its menacing turrets. While Kai and Delon kept staring, Aranya kicked her horse forward. The sooner we proceed, the sooner we arrive, she said. Kai's eyes glittered with amusement. The longer we linger, the more we postpone our arrival. Delon rolled his eyes, giving his mount a sound kick. Just think, for the span of our time here, I won't be alone on babysitting duty. At both of their glares, he only shrugged and held up both hands in a placating gesture. I mean, forgive me, you both are competent and intellectually stimulating comrades. Aranya should have given him a sour glare to match Kai's, but she couldn't help her grin. Almost there, almost there. It was dark before Delon sent Kai ahead to scout out the camp and ensure it was Junning High, not enemy troops, that camped on their side of the border. Kai was back shortly with this affirmation, and they proceeded onward to the encampment. She was perhaps expecting a warm welcome, a bid to sit down by the fire and eat of a prepared hearty stew, or even an offer to brush down her horse and hobble it for the evening. Instead, when they entered, the place was a frenzy of commotion. <laughs>